All right, so for our last event of the evening, we have the illustrious founders of Kubernetes, um, Joe, Craig, and Grant Wu. And Chris from Heptio will be doing a panel discussion about the beginnings of Kubernetes. Check, one, two, can you guys hear me? Cool, how's everybody doing tonight? Thanks for coming out, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what that means, I just moved here, so. <laughs> oh, sports ball, got it, got it. <laughs> nice, cool. So yeah, we're gonna be doing a, a panel on Kubernetes from the beginning, and going into like the history, where we are today, what's next, we're gonna touch on a lot of stuff. Uh, I've worked with all three of these guys since I got involved with cognitive technology, so I'm actually really excited to get to do a panel with them. Uh, so the first question we have, Actually, before we do that, um, if anybody has any questions they would like for me to ask, feel free to like shoot them my way on Twitter or something, and I'll make sure you get a shout out. But the first question we have is, what was the dawn of the project like? Who was involved? So we have the, the, the fourth Beetle, yeah. <laughs> who really should be here. Who, who was Vile? Where's Rigo? Vile, uh, so um, we, we started kicking it around. Um, originally, it was going to be like a demo. It was just going to be like a demo of what you could do on the cloud. Um, and we started kicking it around. Um, and Vila is this guy who we work with, um, who did a lot of the early development work and a lot of the early thought work was also working with us. Um, and it was really, it was pretty hacky. I'm going to be straight up. It was hacky. Um, I wrote the API server part in Java first. Um, and I totally sandbagged. Like these guys were like, you have to write React and go. And I was like, it's going to take. Weeks to rewrite it and go, I totally stand back. It, like, it was like when they finally convinced me, it was like two days. Um, uh, but I don't know, that's, that's my memories. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was kind of interesting. We were, uh, so Joe and I worked on Compute Engine a bunch. Brennan was working on this project called Nike. I didn't, I didn't really like a Nike. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out. Um, and so, um, you know, we sort of playing with these ideas, trying to find that sweet spot between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Um, and I remember, you know, my, my earliest recollection of this whole thing is uh, Joe coming to me and saying, uh, hey man, you gotta check out this Docker thing. And I was like, what the hell is Docker? I thought we were talking about Heroku build packs. I think that was what you were wanting to before that. Um, and so we started, uh, you know, sort of looking at it and it was, it was kind of interesting. And you know, Brennan uh, was uh, was someone we started working with, and he was doing some interesting work around uh, a sort of a JSON way of thinking about orchestration. Um, and uh, I think there were there were a couple of like, key moments that I was just kind of calling out. You know, the first was um, you know, like that first experience with Docker. I mean, it, you have to respect what uh, Solomon and the Docker community did. They really put lightning in the bottle. That experience of being able to create a hermetically sealed uh, sort of, you know, deployment was really powerful. That, that changed the way I looked at a lot of things. So, you know, mad respect to the folks from Docker that did that. I think the kind of you know second moment for me personally, and I, I can never remember which of these guys came up with the idea. I mean, like they like a, they both probably like did independently, but this idea that we could lean on that same model, you know, that that open source is powerful, that community is powerful, that. We don't necessarily have to just subscribe, but we can actually create. You know, the source is already huge. And I think for me, the, the final moment in inception that was really kind of profound was um, that we've been talking about a demo, and Brenda put together this little like uh, kind of hacky demo. Uh, Ash and salt. What's the Ash? Bash and salt. Yeah, and the salt like floated us around. Forever, yeah, it did. Right? It was like crazy. Yeah. Um, and when I saw it, I was like, holy shit, that's a Borg cell in five VMs, right? Like, and the thing that was really powerful was not just that it was Borg, but it was an accessible Borg, like a much kind of cuter and, and more approachable form of this monolith that we would never be able to get out there. I just, that was, that was really powerful. Um, and so, and yeah, and it was just there a lot of hacking. Yeah, so let's see. Um, so the first thing is that, you know, when, I think when all of us saw Docker, we recognized that you know there was definitely something there in terms of being able to package things up. But our experiences at Google immediately made us think about what about the cluster? How do you put these things together? And I think it took 
it took probably, I don't know, like I would say a year after that for the rest of the community to realize that the, the whole idea of, of had this been a, a primitive kind of cluster and it really is about the, the interface to the set of machines. It took, it took uh, folks quite a while to, to figure that out. Early on, you know, Brennan used to talk about like, hey, everybody is trying to put together these pieces, um, but because of the experiences at Google, we had the, we had sort of the, the, the picture on the front of the box, right? So instead of having a bunch of puzzle pieces, we had the puzzle pieces plus an idea of how it all came together. Um, and so that, that definitely gave us uh, a lot to work with. The other thing I remember about, you know, starting Kubernetes was um, just a lot of painful presentations to executives. We wrote a lot of, like, we spent probably like three or four months like writing slide decks and white papers and just trying to really paint the picture of, of what this thing could be and why it made sense to do open source and you know comparing and contrasting you know against something like MapReduce with Hadoop uh, and sort of you know this idea that Google put all these interesting ideas out there and then wasn't able to reap the benefits. And so that became one of the one of the motivating factors behind doing Kubernetes open source. And it was it was really painful, it was really hard to convince. And there were a lot of folks who, who really didn't understand the value there. So And I think you mentioned that you mentioned that the community didn't really necessarily see it for a while, but I remember really distinctly, like every single week there was another one. Well kind of. Kind of. I mean kind of, but you just knew. Like I was just like every single week it'd be like I'd open up GitHub and be like, did somebody hit it this time? And it's like, ah, uh, not quite. All right, good. And then the next week, it was like, because we were, I mean, I was freaked out that we were going to get scooped, basically. That, like, something was going to come along, and it was going to be good enough, and the momentum, because you just knew that the momentum was there. And whoever could get it right would harness the momentum and carry it. And, and I was just terrified that somebody was going to, not that somebody would get it absolutely right, because if somebody gets it perfectly right, great, right? Like, but then somebody would get it sort of like, close enough, but not really, and it would look, like, it, we'd know that it could have been better, but we just have no idea that we just couldn't make it. Like, like if somebody did it as a placement, right? Like, my big fear was somebody was going to, like, do sort of, like, an Ansible-style thing. Not to, like, hate on Ansible, because I like Ansible a lot, but sort of a, like, I'm going to put the, these three containers on that machine and these six containers on that machine without the scheduling abstraction, and it would be good enough, and then, like, people would all just go there, and we wouldn't be able to sort of put this quantum leap forward in, in the abstraction that, that people consume. That was definitely something I remember from that. Sort of from like the January to June time frame, right? Where we were really like, we, it was the period where we kind of pretty much knew what we were doing, but we were just trying to get permission to do it effectively. Um, yeah. okay. And so none of us are at Google anymore, but, so we don't have access to it, but I did have somebody reach out to me and say that they looked at some of the original papers that we wrote, sort of saying, we were so right. We were, I mean, we kind of nailed it. <laughs> 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 like, like, I remember looking at the decks that he wrote. Like, Joe had wrote these bullet, bullet point slides and of like, you know, here's how it's going to play out, basically. And like, two years later, it was like, every single bullet point. I was like, and I've never done anything like that. Like, they never come true like that. Like, it was just, it was, yeah. It sounds really super arrogant, but, but it was really true. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Awesome. What's next? Okay, so uh, we had somebody uh, message me on Twitter. Uh, they said they would like to know more about all of us, so I guess we skipped intros. So real quick, let's just go all the way down. We'll start with you, Joe. Um, so I'm, I'm Joe Beat. I'm the CTO of Heptio. Been in industry for about 20 years now. Started my career at Microsoft working on the Internet Explorer. And done. <laughs> Don't hate it. <laughs> You're the one who works for Microsoft It's now. true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, I was at Google for about 10 years doing uh, Compute Engine and then, and then Kubernetes. I'm Greg. Uh, I worked with Joe on Compute Engine and then uh, was part of the crew that started getting going with Kubernetes. I was more of the product guy, so I was the guy who did whatever these two didn't want to do. <laughs> but I have, I, have, I, have strong beliefs. I have strong beliefs that Craig did so much rock fetching behind the scenes with people that I, we just didn't see. Like, that's my suspicion of this thing. We were hacking away on code, and he was like doing the rock fetching exercises for everybody who wanted to know like how this was going to work. So I think we it's a, it's a debt of gratitude. Um, I'm Brendan. Um, I spent about uh, I did a PhD in computer science, and then spent about eight years at Google Web Search first, uh, where I used a lot of this technology, and then cloud, where I 
struggled for a long time to try and convince people to use the technology, and then, as, as you said, Docker really changed the game and really enabled us to, to go out and reach the world. Uh, I'm now working on DevOps for, for Azure for Microsoft's cloud. So I, I reversed it, I guess. They, these guys went to Microsoft first, and then went to Google, and I went to Google first. Cool. And uh, somewhere along the way, while all of Joe's bullet points were coming true, I got involved with the project, uh, joined up with Microsoft, and now I work with Joe and Craig at Heptio, and I'm Chris Nova. Uh, so the next question we have is, where did the name come from? It's Joe. I mean, it's Craig. Is that, that's a Craig. Uh, yeah, Kubernetes. So um, we tried everything. It was a hectic week. It was a hectic week. Uh, I liked Karina. But, oh, the time was running out. So I mean, took it though, then. Wait, what no, 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 no. He can tell the story. No, 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 no. Like HP came along later on. They Somebody did. Came along and, like, used it, really. But I think that particular cell porn star had yeah, yeah, yeah. moved oh, on since then. The, so like, the image search for that. The image search was not, not good. good. Not good. Yeah. Um, so we tried everything. Uh, there were other there were other names we wanted to call it, and um, Google trademark wouldn't let us call it anything. And so I was driving into work one day, and I was kind of desperate. I. Is it me to launch it? <laughs> Yeah, we, we, were like, we were like literally running out of time. We had to, like, we had to pick a name. Um, and so I was like, okay, what am I doing? I'm driving. Uh, okay, like, you know, nautical. Docker's kind of nautical. What's the name, like, for a pilot or a person who drives a ship? Because that's kind of what we're doing. And then I was like, okay, well, let's pick something like ancient Greek and uh, Kubernetes. Um, turns out. You knew off the top of your head, right? Yeah, you just. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, turns out Kubernetes is also the root word for cybernetics. Totally planned it. Uh, totally, totally, totally planned it. <laughs> and governor, both of which are you know pretty big in control theory. Yeah, no idea of that either. Like we just kind of first come to went the whole thing. Um, <laughs> my favorite moment I think was Eric Schmidt uh, from Google standing up on stage and like giving this glowing report about Kubernetes. And he was like, that is the stupidest <laughs> name. <laughs> Every exactly yeah, like put it down you know, certain, you know, they would like snap the stage and be like, uh, you know, it's like a great project, but the name is so stupid. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you have to forgive us, but it kind of worked out okay, I guess. The SEO was really good. It was white space on the internet, yeah. which is a big deal when you want to make a name for something. Although Mr. Kubernetes on Twitter, like, <laughs> he's probably got a lot of attention and love recently. Um, go figure. Okay, so what, what's up with K8S? That's Joe. I, I don't know if who did that. Was, was, was it me? I remember it being you. Okay, so. You know, it's a there's a, a a term for this where you shorten words by actually replacing the number of characters with a with a letter. And so, you know, early on as we were writing code, because I, I did a lot of the bash and salt for setup, and I got tired of writing Kubernetes, and so it got shortened to cube early on. Um, nobody likes cube as the as the the shortening. Uh, so so it's, I I, I might have been Tim Tim Hawking. I swear to God, I remember being. Okay, I don't know. but anyway, so shorting it to, to like K8S, um, sort of like you know, there's internationalization and, and localization, which is like I18 and stuff like that. Um, uh, K8S has the the added benefit that you can actually pronounce it, so like Kates. Yeah. Um, a lot of folks, you know, hate on the fact that it's like more sort of terminology that people have to learn in this world and that type of thing, which is kind of unfortunate, but you know, kind of is what it is. I don't think we can take it back at this point. Plus, I mean, Twitter. Yeah, yeah, Twitter. You know, we have more characters now. Well, it's true, but back in those days, we only had 140 characters. <laughs> it's every character, right? Yeah. Okay. I do need to plug it in. Uh, okay, so we have K8S, but what's up with the seven spokes? All right, so. <laughs> Four was the system inside of Google. And this was all, this was all Brendan was. Um, he wanted to do a friendlier board, so he called the project originally Seven of Nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the really guilty part there is that I actually did watch all, however many series, seasons of Voyager. Um, I actually think that's kind of a guilty admission there. So actually, yeah, so Seven of Nine, if you haven't watched Star Trek Voyager, you totally should. Under Underappreciated Star Trek series uh, is the, like, the humanized Borg, um, and so that was where Seven of Nine came. So it, it, Seven Spokes, it started out as Seven Spoke, Started out as the project, or seven of nine, and then it got abbreviated. Project. I really love Project Seven. I just wish we could have called it Project Seven. And there was some like cold fusion. I don't know if 
if people remember Cold Fusion. Like, <laughs> Cold Fusion. I, I actually wrote Cold Fusion pages back in the day, so like, I was a blast from the past for me. But there's some like Cold Fusion software package that was called Project 7, and so it failed trademark, and so we couldn't call it Project 7. I just love Project 7, because like, what happened to the other six projects, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Uh, so the, the other thing, this is, uh, this is not spoken of much, but um, you'll notice most of the Google logos have six sides. Um, so I went to Brian Goldfarb, who ran marketing at Google at the time, and I was like, hey, Brian, I'm going to do this project. And he was like, what is it? And it's like, uh, Kubernetes. And he's like, what is that? He's like, it's an open source project, and we need a logo. And uh, he was like, I don't give a yeah. F. Uh, use whatever logo you like. And I was like, excellent. <laughs> and so we picked a logo that looked... Tinker. Yeah, just wrong. Like, I wanted something that had seven sides, because all the Google logos had six sides. And then we picked a blue that would look just wrong. Like, we've been trying really hard to match it, just didn't get it quite right, because we were just being assholes, I think, at the time. Tim says you did a lot about of course, it's how you heard a lot of things. And then you Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so the. <laughs> <laughs> so we had stickers made. And uh, we had them out, and then it was too late because the stickers were out there in the universe. And uh, Tim, I actually asked Tim to do the, the seven spoke wheel for us. Um, and then uh, the execs finally figured it out because they were all sitting around like talking about the success of Kubernetes, and they all had the logo on their laptop. And it was the only logo they had. They didn't actually have the other. other thing. Other stuff, and like you know, they looked at each other and they're like, "Huh, that logo has seven sides, doesn't it?" They tried to fit the other ones around. <laughs> and like when they tried to fit it around, and they realized that it had. And they're like, sides. "Those guys." I mean, I used a stronger word than that, but <laughs> <laughs> we just try to be like, you know, we always kind of style ourselves as a pirate crew. We want to do something that was different, and you know, like had a unique identity, and that was was not necessarily tied to one vendor. And so uh, it was a lot of fun to kind of have fun with the system from inside. Sorry, I gotta turn the microphone on every time. Okay, so this is a, this is a question, and, and Brendan, I know you have a PhD in robotics, so I have a feeling this is gonna involve you, but we had somebody ask uh, about control theory and the control loops. Where did those come from, and who wrote the first one? I don't know who wrote the first one. Um, I think it's definitely influenced by, I mean, definitely, I, I like the PhD in robotics, thinking a lot about control theory definitely factors in, but I think anybody who's done and I think Joe knew this from GCE. Anybody who's done distributed systems um, kind of hates state machines. I at least hate state machines. Like they're just they're evil. Like they they you build state machines, you build real software because you don't anticipate changes, you don't react to if the environment is ever not the way you expect it, bad things happen. Whereas, and you know, and I, I think Craig was sort of the first one who sort of said, you know, like we're trying to build like the B two bomber of software, right? Where like that stealth machine can't fly without a computer in the loop, right? Um, and so this idea of self-stabilizing self software, you know, software that can wake up at any moment and notice where it is, it's just way more redundant and, and safe than anything else. And so I don't actually remember, maybe these guys do, I don't remember where it came from. I think it was just sort of accepted. Like we just kind of knew that it was the right way to build it. I think uh, some, a lot of the ideas, you know, were influenced. I mean, this was part of the mix between well, at the same time when Kubernetes was getting created, Google was smashing together the cloud teams that were sort of started up here in Seattle along with technical infrastructure teams that were being driven out of Mountain View. And so there was a lot of sort of mixing of ideas. And um, I think a lot of those ideas were, were being prototyped at the time with Omega also. So I think, you know, this, is, this was the, the TI's, you know, uh, uh, second system reinvention of board type of thing. And so um, they were they were trying to distill learnings and come up with new ideas out of ten years of board uh, and some of the some of the ways to you know to, to have systems communicating via writing to a database, right? Which is essentially how Kubernetes works with these control control loops and ended up being, I think, you know, one of the things that they had talked about a lot in Omega in that point, but I don't think they'd actually put a lot of it into But they also not, I think the big distinction was they didn't put it in yeah, they, they had things talking directly to the data. I guess, and I think it's the sort of big, that was a big mistake, I think, was to sort of add, like, all, everything partying in the same database and it's the like, yeah. you, you, all the versioning is incredibly beautiful. You don't have that data. So 
Yeah, yeah. So we knew we needed to have a policy thing between between the actors and the database. Um, I do remember when we when when we were designing the API, um, the and this was a change from Borg, was, was pulling out the idea of a pod, and at that time what was called the replication controller, the thing that was doing the replication. Yeah, do you remember how long you spent trying to do that thing? Oh, we still screwed it up. Oh, we still screwed it up. <laughs> that so long trying to do I still, I... We were talking about governor. Yeah, well, regardless, I think, you know, that, um, and I remember saying, okay, I want, when, when someone tries to understand what the replication controller does, I want them to say, oh, look at the world, if this happens, do this, and then just do that in a loop. I wanted to be able to give folks a good mental model for how this stuff worked. And so I think the primitives and what they do and how you sort of wrap your heads around those were part and parcel of that control loop, that controller idea. I do remember at times, though, like, I do remember at times sort of really trying to be draconian with some, some people about not having state. Right. I think the very first state that we put into the system was, that wasn't in the API server. The very first like controller level state was in the kubelet um, to tombstone so that you could figure out effectively like how many times you'd restarted. Like there's some stuff where it's like if you want to keep track of the number of times you restarted, you need something locally basically to like tombstone the fact that you just died, right? Um, yeah, and we went through all these backflips to try, and this was Tim Hawken who did a lot of this stuff, to try not to store state with the kubelet. He came up with this whole encoding scheme using sort of the set of characters that you could name Docker containers with because this was before Docker had labels and stuff like that so that we could cram enough information so that we could relate it back to the pod. So he essentially did like a, a puny code type of thing for Docker names. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so this next question we have from Tomiko at Heptio. If you could go back and change one thing in Kubernetes, what would you change? Are you go first? I'm missing what you said. Pod template. I think pod template should have been out as an object by itself. That's the probably the number one thing. I think we learned other lessons. I mean, I think stateful set versus replica set, but we fixed it, right? Like. There was, that was a place where we learned a lesson and we could fix it, but like pod template, we just can't pull it out, really. Um, and I feel like we should. We should have, so. The, the service is an endpoint object is really awkward. I think we crammed too much stuff into service. Um, I, I think it was Brendan who added the type equals load balancer, like the moral equivalent at one point. You just hack something in there. I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, like, there, there is talk now of trying. Littered with my bad ideas. I, I, I think there's some, um, there's some work now. I know Tim Hawkins looking at thinking about how can we sort of evolve service and endpoint and, and you know try and factor those things better. But I wrote the chapter in our book on services and service discovery, and like it was complicated because it does like four different things. I don't think I'd change, I mean, this this probably tweaking that can be done in the architecture. I think that the system looks pretty damn well. I think I would have spent a lot more time earlier on focusing on like day one, day two ops for the platform. I think it suffered from the tragedy of the commons. Um, you know, each and every one of the vendors has, you know, their own interest in getting, um, you know, like when we were in Google, it was pretty easy to be like, if you don't like the installation, use Google Kubernetes engine or Google Container engine, right? And that was true across a lot of different places. You know, all of the distro providers had their own installation experience. And I think we, as a community, significantly neglected day one, day two ops for people who were just trying to get in there with the open source bits. If I could go do it again, I would have... Well, Chris has been working on it. She's really good, yeah, so great. Like, but, you know, like it's, it's just something that we could have put a lot more time into, like getting Kubernetes and stuff getting secure bootstrapping out there, starting to really think about just, you know, there's some of the stuff that Chris is doing now with the cluster API folks, uh, with the cloud API stuff. Um, cluster API, sorry. Um, you know, we should have done that a long time back. And I think that would have accelerated the adoption engagement with the community a lot quicker. Plus one, for the record. I, I have one other thing that, that I think none of us thought about, um, which is we should have turned to governance earlier. Um, I think we underestimated the rate at which the project was growing, or we underestimated the complexity that the rate at which the project was growing was putting on the community or something. I mean, like, I think we just didn't think about it. Like, I think it was just something we didn't think about. Um, 
I think we got really lucky that we didn't have a crisis earlier. Like, I, I, I think we got really, really lucky. I think we could have had a really bad governance situation, and we just didn't, and I think that speaks testament to the culture that we built and the people who are involved. But we should have probably started on governance a, week, a, a year earlier than we did, um, so. Uh, I want to change my answer. Um, the salt and the bash and the cluster directory. Um, I think we were not, I, I was naive, and I think you know we wrote a lot of, but, of that stuff with this idea of like, well, if you turn on bash script and magically you get a cluster, then who cares what's happening under the covers? Oh man, we totally did not understand that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I wrote it. I don't, I don't know. I wrote a stack trace function yes. in bash. Yes. <laughs> it's, I think it's still there. It's still there. That is like the most glorious thing. <laughs> I took bash seriously, man. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so next question is, uh, Kubernetes has a crazy high adoption rate. Like, we've got our friends at Amazon, we've got people here from Google, we've got Microsoft on stage, my microphone turned off again. Uh, yeah, so we've got people from Microsoft, Amazon, Google. Uh, what do you guys think caused this high adoption rate in Kubernetes? Nobody cares about it. I mean, I, I think that's actually the ultimate thing is like it's it's intended to sort of fade into the background and be something that you build on top of and so I think once it became clear that it's like saying why does everybody care about x86 or why does everybody have x86 I mean I don't know because like, everybody wants to use it um, so I think that's I think that's that's what it is right I mean I think we were I think we did a lot of stuff right in terms of building an ecosystem I think one of the things we focused on early early on I, I feel like I was a student of the um, BSD Linux wars in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, and it, it, it's clear to me that Linux won because of the ecosystem um, and the ecosystem to build up around it. And uh, I, I took that lesson into Kubernetes to build a community. I think that's part of it. Um, but I think also like people just the, the abstraction makes sense, and people want to consume it, and people want to forget about it. And so the sooner the clouds provide it and then can build on top, the better the world goes. So I don't know. So I think it was, I was at, at BlueCon once and there was somebody, I think it was an analyst that put a slide on, it was talking about, I think it was, I, think I want to say somebody from Red Moncton, and, uh, and they had a slide where they talked about different types of databases, and some of the databases were very much tilted towards the, the development world about getting easy, up and easy to, easy to go, uh, 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 easy to get up and running, um, with an example of something like Mongo, and then there's other databases that are very much the operator's friend, it's about long haul, serious never lose data and you have something like you know oracle you know on, on, on the other side if you look at something like mysql or postgres they're they're kind of in the middle right they're not hard to, to get up and running with but they actually also have legs for the long term and i think one of the things that we wanted to do out the gate that i think worked out well was find that middle middle path where it, it could both appeal to folks from the developer mindset but also folks from the operations mindset and I think that that ended up working well, especially when you consider that, you know, I, I think on that spectrum, Docker, at least initially, was all the way on the developer uh, uh, side of the house, and that I think led to a lot of the, the early success. Whereas, you know, Mesosphere, very much on the on the operators, let's have a project, it's going to be a build out type of thing. We wanted something that could scale from a DevOps tool that something somebody self applies to something that could could rival sort of board clusters inside of Google. At least eventually, when we started. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that I think one of the most kind of seminal moments for us, uh, something I, I pushed the team very hard on, which was, I mean, not focus on 100 nodes. I mean, do you remember that? Um, it was interesting because at the time, uh, the main contender against Kubernetes was uh, Mesosphere, right? And um, I remember getting so much heat when we produced the project where, you know, they were like, oh, it's a toy, it doesn't scale across to 100 nodes, etc. And I think, you know, really focusing on that sub-100 nodes was good for a couple reasons. Um, you know, first and foremost, we just weren't ready for more than that. In fact, I mean, like, the, if you think about the mechanics of, of building out a 1,000 node or 2,000 node cluster, like, signaling to the community that you're ready for a certain class of workload and a certain use case before you're ready just is, is, is really unwise. And I think we were very judicious about positioning the technology about where it was. But more importantly, 
we position this the technology is not as something that you needed an expert team to build out from like uh, you know like this sort of classic Mesos build out where you go and find five thousand nodes of physical hardware and then requisition them and then you know stand up an operations team and turn that into a cluster and then get a second tier scheduler and then do all this stuff. We just wanted to cater to the people that were using puppet ship and so on. So we weren't competing with Mesos here. I wouldn't even think about it that way. Mesos. Mesos. Mesos, sorry, not Mesos. Um, and so, uh, you know, coming at it from that, that side of the market, really making it useful, like that vision that, you know, Brennan had when we, put, when we saw that demo, where it was like, this is a ball cluster, they're, it's five VMs, and they're, they create a little mini um, mainframe type experience, but it's, it's accessible. Um, I think that was kind of huge. And I think just staying true to that vision, where it's more about, not just about the developer, it's about bringing better operations practices. It's not getting ahead of ourselves, it's just staying where the community is. Uh, it was about being open and honest and, and just trying to do right by the developers and the community and our partners and everyone else and kind of came together pretty well. Cool. So next question we have is what's with all the ammo? Where did that come from? It's the least bad alternative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, when you're building a system, and I remember we did something similar with, with engine at some point you string everything together and then you're like well crap now we need something to actually send requests to this thing uh, I remember there was this machine learning product at Google and they gave demos at like a Google IO where they were like using curl to upload stuff to the API <laughs> and it's like and so um, we're like well you know that looks bad <laughs> So, uh, so let's create something that's like a specialized version of curl that throws stuff at, uh, at, at, at Kubernetes. And that, that essentially was the genesis of Kube Control. It was called Kube Config originally, and then it got renamed to Kube Control. Rebuilt. Yeah, or rebuilt. Um, and then at one point we're like, well, JSON's so hard to offer, right? Because there's no comments, and there's a quoting, and there's commas, and blah, blah, blah. And so we're like, well, let's just have an easier JSON. And we're like, well, YAML seems easier. And then, like, I think nobody expected that that was going to be the thing that everybody trained on in the long term, right? And I think it's been, um, it's been somewhat of a failure of the community that we haven't sort of, you know, gelled on something to replace it or a set of things to replace it. I think there's a bunch of folks working on it in different forms, but. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised it's still an unsolved problem at this point. I don't think anybody's ever that. Yeah, no, it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like, in the history, it's like, there's certain things where it's like, there is no one answer, like, there's never going to be a perfect programming language, there's never going to be a perfect build system, like a make system, and I don't think there's going to be like a perfect configuration system, right? I think it's just these things where, where there's just, you know, different sweet spots, different styles, yeah. No, I swear it's the positive madness. I think as a, a low sort of a low level inter intermediate language, it makes a ton of sense. I think a lot of us always had in mind that we'd create high level abstractions that would compile down to that IL, and they'd have a good tool chain to deal with the IL. We're only really now starting to chew on what those abstractions need to be. Um, I think there's several ways that people lose their mind and go um, go off the rails here. You know, one path is to try to construct a perfect DSL, and that often leads to bad outcomes. I think the other path is is to recognize you can't you know, model everything and then you start to introduce a whole bunch of uh, programming language constructs in DSL. And that's eventually becomes true and compete and you lose your mind. So you know, there's probably something in there that, that we haven't seen, but I guarantee it's not going to work for everyone. Like, this is going to be the situation where there is no unified field theory of configuration. Um, everyone who tries to pursue that eventually just goes mad. Um, it's kind of like alchemy, I guess. Um, but I think what we will start to see is a lot better solutions for specific problems that, that cater to experiences for teams that are in certain situations that cater to taste or preferences or, or tuning. And, and that, that, that's great. You know, we'll start to see a lot of innovation in that space. Yeah, I think one of the concerns that happens here is that the people who build these systems are distributed systems people, right? Like the people who go build computer systems, like Kubernetes or anything else are distributed systems people. And, and they don't think about developer experience as much as I think we should. And I think you, so you get to this level and you're like, cool, I can send these raw API objects at it. And I kind of understand it. And, like, and you, you don't have that passion. I mean, I think some people do, and I, I, I've been finding it and other people do. But like, I think the trouble is most of the people involved don't necessarily have that passion to take the next step, to go yeah, to the next level. Yeah. It's like, oh, I got these objects. I mean, you figure it out. You figure it out. <laughs> you figure it out, right? Um, and, uh, 
and that's a failure. I mean, and I think I've, we've seen that repeatedly, is that we built an assembly language, how do we build the compiler for the assembly language? And we need to go do that. And you, you all need to go do that, right? Uh, so. We have ideas, but we're not sure we're going. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. <laughs> Rad, next question. Okay, what do you think is the next big obstacle for Kubernetes to overcome? No, I think I think um, one of the things that we're tackling head on, and I think it's a painful, slow process, is is the governance stuff. Um, I think growing the community in a healthy way, where where we can, uh, uh, you know, continue to mature Kubernetes uh, in a responsible way, um, is going to be difficult. Um, making sure that we don't see, you know, it turn into a vendor fest or turn into sort of a kitchen sink. So making sure we have appropriate scope for Kubernetes. Um, and that you know, you know, that we can maintain the community as it becomes boring. I think that's going to be a huge challenge. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably the the biggest thing. And then I think that there's this question of of now what? I think we're going to be seeing a you know a huge fragmentation of all the stuff building on top of Kubernetes. There's a ton of interesting ideas. You know, uh, people are experimenting because you have these new capabilities that you can almost assume at this point. And so I think we're going to see a certain amount of fragmentation there. And I think that there's going to be a tension between systems that work well and become part of a larger ecosystem versus systems that try and wrap Kubernetes and use it as, and you know, and seeing the ones that actually create that larger ecosystem and what that looks like is going to be, uh, I think, both an opportunity and a challenge moving forward. You know, it's interesting. If you look at why Docker works, like at the heart of it, uh, it's because the Linux Cisco layer is just stupidly fantastically stable. It's because Linus Torvald stands between user land and craziness, right? You break your head if you, if you get in the way. Um, I think one of the key challenges we're going to face in this community is we really want Kubernetes to evolve as that kernel for distributed systems development, right? That's that's the promise. It's you know, we don't want to get on user land. Like there's going to be a, a plethora of wonderful things that people are going to build and innovate on in that space. It needs to be incredibly, unbelievably consistent from environment to environment, just like the Linux kernel. That's why Docker works, right? It's because literally, the 199 Linux syscalls just work the same pretty much everywhere. So the big challenge for us, and this is the kind of something I'm personally really starting to think a lot about, is how do we get there? Right? Like how do we get to the point where the core of Kubernetes is, is pretty much done, right? It's as stable as the Linux syscall interface. Look, Kubernetes will never be done, just like the Linux kernel is never done. But how do we get to a point where it is it is stable, where we have people starting to build out a really accessible set of user and componentry that works for the set of use cases that people want? And how do we make that meaningful so that you know if you're building something on top of this distributed system kernel, it just works everywhere? That's that's going to be the, the fascinating next step for us as a community. I think there's one other interesting thing, which is I. Um, I view Ansible as sort of like the punk rock of DevOps. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but like I feel like Ansible is the punk rock of DevOps, where you're like punk rock evolved in the context of progressive rock as a as a statement against complexity, as a statement against over designed and over engineered music. And I I kind of believe that there's an Ansible moment out there for Kubernetes. I think that there's a moment that where people are going to be like. All these control loops and all this active stuff that I don't really understand. I don't like it. I want something simple. I want something stripped down. I want something that explains to me exactly what it's doing and does exactly what I ask it to do. Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge. I think that's going to be a moment. Like you, you, you saw that in the growth of Ansible in reaction to Chef and Puppet and Salt. Like there's a moment there where a group of people would say, you know, effectively like. We don't want that complexity anymore, and, and I think I strongly believe in the automation, and I strongly believe in the control loops. But like our ability to continue to be attractive, even as the complexity might grow or as things get hidden from people, is going to be key to our success. I think so. I don't know. That's something I think a lot about. Next question: um, What is the biggest challenge you faced when designing and releasing Kubernetes version 1.0? As Joe said, getting approval to launch it was really, really hard. <laughs> um, really harder than it should have been. Um, yeah. Talk about more paper and how long that took. Yeah, there's a question. 
Yeah, so the question is, why was it so hard? Um, I think there was a belief that it was secret sauce. Um, I think that's a false belief, because like so many people had left the company by that point. It's not like it was secret. Um, and I think there was a degree to which um, there's different kinds of open source projects, and the kind of open source project that we were proposing, where it was really kind of selfless and really community driven, um, was not like the value prop of that wasn't clear to people. Um, I think there was a lot of like, I mean, we, we got a lot early on of like, oh, nice, you're inventing Ruby on Rails again. Like that was definitely like, people were sort of like, this is gonna be a flash in the pan. Everybody's gonna go back to, and I actually still think about that sometimes. Like everybody's gonna go back to VMs and like, you know, like it'll be a nice little cute thing that you did. Um, and so there's a degree of that. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think it was, and, and I don't know, I mean, it just was hard. I think, I think there's also like the Game of Thrones aspects of it, which is like, um, in a big corporate environment, people who are in com who are competing in the Game of Thrones don't want to take risks, right? So I think literally the only person who kind of stood up and put his personal reputation on the line was Eric Brewer, um, and where he stood up and said, "I think this is the most important thing that we can do in this meeting with a bunch of executives," and that kind of help helped. Um, but like, there's just a lot of like, I think at a certain point, people who are senior in company, I shouldn't say things like this, but too bad. Um, people who are senior in companies, like their core competency at some level is being senior in companies, right? Like, and, and so they get really kind of careful and, and they, they don't want to take risks and we were a risk. So, um, so two things, so there's this old proverb that success has a thousand fathers and failure is an orphan. <laughs> And so it was fascinating to see, you know, inside of Google as as Kubernetes got more and more traction, the people who came out of the woodwork who had sort of we like totally supported it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I think there was one person I won't name names. It says like, you know, I know there's a unicorn in there somewhere because I see all the unicorn shit, but I'm not sure where. <laughs> that said that about Kubernetes. And, and like three, months later, three months later, he's like, I supported this thing the whole time. <laughs> um, so that, I mean, that was just personally painful to deal with that. Uh, you know, you kind of have to kind of have to put the ego aside as part of that. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that was difficult. There was one other thing I was going to bring up, but I can't remember now. So, all right. Well. I mean, you know, stepping back, I think the thing is it just wasn't obvious. Like Kubernetes wasn't obvious. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with all the guys, just all the people. That's not great. Um, don't take me anywhere. Um, there were a lot of people that were really smart, and they eventually got it. But I don't know if like we just weren't very good at explaining it, or like you know trying to paint the picture or create the narrative. But I think it just wasn't obvious. And you know, it, the thing that was interesting is it wasn't a pattern that just existed inside Google. It was a pattern outside Google as well. I mean. We had the same sort of conversations, you know, and they were eerily symmetric between like folks at Docker uh, around like, hey, we'd like to do this thing, and this is what we think the value is, and they're like, no, it's going to be too complicated from a developer experience perspective. And we're like, okay, well, we'll do it. Um, I think it's just hard to get your head around something that is disruptive, and that becomes personally difficult when you can feel it, but you can't say it, or when you can feel it, and you can say it, but you, that people don't necessarily believe you. Um, and I think that just was, it was hard. Um, you know, I think there, I was really glad there were three of us, because I think that there'd only been two of us. There was always a time when two of us like, ah, oh, it's never gonna happen. And the other one was like, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Am I gonna quit the meter? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was always hard, it was yeah. always hard. I remember when Slider was, we had whiteboards, and I think I had a, I had a whiteboard which was like, I'm gonna quit today, or I'm gonna quit in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of like bar, yeah. You know, like, but um, you know, if you have three people, um, someone's always positive, and it kind of they can always and the red door. And the red door. We spend a lot of time drinking beer at the red door. One, one more story. I do remember. Right, so I remember the meeting where we got the go ahead. Yes. Um, someone wasn't there. We were <laughs> Um, but uh, it was Urs, who's, you know, muckety muck at Google, who, who gave us the green light. And he's like, I don't know what his title is, but he's super senior VP, right? He's a dude, he's a dude. They have this picture, guys, he's my first They have this picture that you see in search infrastructure. He's doing the first index move. 
the first move of the Google search index from one data center to the next data center, it's a box of hard drives in the back of his Civic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so Orz had been around at Google forever. He like led all the TI, um, and then and then under him was the was the the TI senior VP, not the super senior VP. I don't even know what the titles were. And and this person had sort of blocked us the whole way. And so finally, we like you know with help from, from, from Eric Brewer, finally got the meeting with Urs. This other VP was there uh, and, you know, and we presented our case, and I think it was, it was Brendan presenting that. And then at some point, it was just like, okay, this sounds good, let's do that. And then all of a sudden, the senior VP that blocked us the whole time just started doing email. You could tell he like checked out. He's like, he's like, he's like, I lost. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's, you know, that's the we, big company we, game of thrones. It was like, don't even bother with slides after slide one or two, because like, you're just going to go off into the weeds and don't even bother. And I think we got in, and it was like, next, 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 next. And I remember distinctly, I don't know if you remember, but I remember you and I, it was like, wow, well, 1 p.m. or something like that. We went outside, we were down in the bay, uh, and we went out, so it was a nice sunny day. And it was like, it, had been, it was crappy in Seattle still, like rainy and crappy or whatever in Seattle, and, but it was nice in the bay. And I, we just sat there, I think. Like, I just like, couldn't move, like, I couldn't, like, and like just, I just remember that, just sitting in these chairs in the sun, being like, did that really? Because we've been just thinking about it for so long. Yeah, right? the green light. And it was like, oh, well, all right, now we're going. Right? So I, I, that's a memory I'll keep around for a long time. So. All right, so we, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. questions? Cool. Well, like seriously, just got goose up on to you guys. Um, okay, so the next question we have here is, uh, was there anything that was unexpected about starting this project that you guys weren't really expecting to see that maybe it came up? I don't think in my wildest dreams, I mean, these guys can say, I don't think in my wildest dreams I thought that we'd be here now. Not even remotely close. Right? I mean, I think we thought maybe we'd be interesting and relevant at some level, but like, yeah, like, this has been an amazingly humbling experience. So that's, that's where I'm at. Also, I think, you know, the, the community that formed around Kubernetes and how that formed and the dedication of folks, I think that really took me by surprise. Um, you know, I think this started with the Red Hat folks who joined us relatively early, um, put, a lot of, put a lot of effort into it, um, brought some really good ideas. Um, that took me by surprise. I and mean, we did some work, some groundwork to try and, and convince Red Hat to, to base the next version of OpenShift on Kubernetes. Um, but uh, you know they really brought it, so I think that that really took my surprise too. And I think I think would not have been as successful. Yeah, I think we really, 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 I think we owe them. They bought in really early, and we owe them a real bit of Clayton and all those folks a real bit of gratitude. Cool. Uh, so this is our last question. So, uh, what would you say uh, to somebody who's looking to get involved in Kubernetes? What would be a good first step for them to get involved in the project and start making contributions? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too hard. Um, you know, we continue to try and make it better, but it's too hard. Way, way, way too hard. Um, uh, I mean, I, I guess I would say is like, it's not hard on purpose. We, we haven't made it hard because we don't want you, and we haven't made it hard because we don't value your contributions. It's, we're badly organized, and we don't like to write docs. And, I mean, we're just like engineers at the end of the day, and like, Everything that was, you know, everything that's horrible about your engineering project is horrible about our engineering project. <laughs> like, I don't know. So inside of Google, there's this this uh, site where people can post memes, and it's it's really one of the best things about working at Google. <laughs> and there's this meme where um, they have a picture of one of the Google mini kitchens, and it has a a, a bowl of like bananas. And then it has a label under it that says apples. <laughs> and then like the meme was some documentation may be out of date. <laughs> that's, that's Kubernetes in a nutshell right there. <laughs> I mean, I think this also so at some level comes back down to governance, which is, I mean not governance specifically, but like I don't think that we I think we dramatically underestimated the complexity that would be that would come from the project scaling. And I think we just didn't put the time and energy into scaling processes, scaling documentation, like just all of these aspects of scale that we just didn't think about and, and that we still struggle with. And so I guess like, 
I guess what I would also say is just like keep with it and also we're really, really friendly. I mean, I think that's what's been incredible, honestly, like we're incredible about this community is, is the degree to which we've said we value community and friendliness and approachability more than anything else and I think that's unique. Um, and so like we're here to help. We're sorry that it sucks, but we're here to help. And, and, and if you stick with it, we will get you to a good place where you feel happy and comfortable and confident. And, and mostly, like, it's not your fault, it's our fault. Right? So practical advice, um, find a SIG, start going to those meetings, make that SIG your tribe. We're working to, 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 to give more power to those SIGs so they can actually run as sort of mini projects um, so that they're so that we create a smaller sort of unit of community so that folks can actually, you know, have folks that they know and they go to meetings every week and they, you know, have somebody that they that they feel friendly with that they can ask to code review or, or you know, help guide them. Um, so don't focus on the project, focus on a SIG. And then the next thing is, like, if you want to contribute to Kubernetes, you know, you don't have to, right? You can build interesting stuff on top of Kubernetes with never talking to anybody as part of the Kubernetes project. And that's one of the key things that we're working on enabling, right? You can go off and build the next super duper awesome system on top of Kubernetes um, without having to touch the core and deal with the messiness that's there. You, you still have to deal with the lack of documentation, but you know, beyond that. And, and, and just to be clear, the documentation team is working super, super hard. I don't want to actually yeah, give them yeah, short shrift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but but you know, there's a lot to cover, and uh, and, and they're stretched super thin. And I think they're doing a good job, um, you know, trying to keep up with the project. So I, I definitely want to give props to the to the documentation folks. And I would actually say that I profoundly believe that the most leverage, the most interesting innovation, is happening above the API surface area. Right. So like, if you want to do something exciting and interesting. I think above the surface of the API area, the surface of the API area is the place to be. Right? Like core contributing to Kubernetes right now is like core contributing to Linux. Like it's gonna be painful and like honestly you're probably just gonna like, you know, make your laptop parse the ACPI spec a little better. Right? Like it's just not like it's not gonna be a, a step like and that's great if like your battery doesn't show up and now your battery does, that's fantastic. But like and props to whoever made Linux run on my service book, like very thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, but like the the exciting innovation, the new stuff is all happening above the API layer, so definitely, and it's just an easier place to be. There's smaller groups of people, more experimentation. Um, so definitely, that's a that's a really great place to make make an impact. Cool. All right. Well, big round of applause for your show. Speaking with approachability and community, I think client is evidence of that. So thank you, gentlemen, uh, and thank you everybody else for sticking around. This day. We went over, but thanks a lot. I just uh, one, two, two quick announcements. Uh, we've got doctor's birthday next week on Tuesday, so there's another event planned there. Um, thank you for the slides, John, for mentioning that as a reminder. And then uh, Andrew uh, from User Research International had just asked me to mention that he's looking for folks to. to uh, uh, participate in paid research studies for uh, creating a better product experience. I'm uh, guessing it's Kubernetes related. Andrew's right there. So if anybody's interested, uh, talk to him. Otherwise, thanks for coming. Have a good night and drive safe. We'll see you.